Excursions are one of the biggest extra costs when we go on a cruise vacation. So it never ceases to amaze me the bizarre choices and things that I see my fellow cruisers doing when planning, booking, or going on them. So stick around to hear about the five most remarkable errors that I've seen and what they should have been doing instead. So you, of course, can avoid them. Welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, making it easy to get cruising right every time, including on cruise excursions. The first mistake I see is cruisers not researching the port before going so they can decide what the very, very best things to see or do in them are. So if you don't, you're relying on what the cruise line is offering and you're assuming that they include always the must and the, the absolute best sea places. However, I've learned that may not always be the case because of course lines have to rely on whatever capacity their specific tour operator partner has available when that ship is calling into port. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take you to see the very best things. They will just offer you what it makes sense to provide. So you may be missing out in a particular cruise port. But also by researching the port, you will know if you should even do an excursion or whether you should self-explore and more on that topic later. Now my go-to for researching cruise ports is a site called whatsinport.com because they have coverage of even the most obscure ports. It tells me where the ship is going to be docking, what's within easy access, how easy it is to explore, safety issues, public transport options, the key sites to see, and on and on and on. Now another critical thing that I always check by port, by port, close to the time is the weather so I can be prepared because of course it chops and changes. So for example, on my recent Region 7 Seas cruise to Japan, I could see that really heavy rain was forecast when we were going to be in Tokyo. So I actually just packed an umbrella and a bit of a raincoat into my suitcase. And so unlike my fellow guests that were getting really wet or having to stay on the bus to avoid the rain, I could still get out and see the Imperial Palace, the Meiji Shrine, the Hamara Keiyodo Gardens, and it was in relative comfort because I was prepared. However, this next mistake is something I see creating more problems when it comes to excursions than anything else. And that quite simply is not checking the fine print in the excursion details and terms. This was the cause of pretty much all of the issues on excursions that I saw on recent cruises. And there are actually surprisingly five things that you absolutely need to check. First of all, check the activity or fitness level required. All cruise lines classify excursions. So for example, on that recent Region Japan cruise I was talking about, they had three clear distinct categories that each tour was rated against with descriptions of like the amount of walking, steps, standing time, and other kind of physical considerations. However, still on many excursions I went to on that trip, I saw people really struggling because they hadn't checked the fitness and mobility. So for example, we went to visit the Kuzuzan Toshugu Shrine in Shimuzu. These had really steep stone steps that just many people could not cope with. The cruise before that, I was in French Polynesia and I booked a cycling tour which included a ride up to a mountain viewpoint. However, people just hadn't read the fitness and ability detail. So some ended up having to wait at the bottom of the mountain because they just couldn't do it, while most of us spent half of the excursion time up on the mountain viewpoint. I went to the Ruogado Caves in Kochi. It had really steep climbs, it had tight spaces, it had a total of 800 steps, which people, when they got there, realized they just couldn't do it. So they had to sit outside while we spent an hour or so in the caves. Also check the activity levels for weight and height or age limits. For example, I did a helicopter ride on my last Alaska cruise up to the glaciers in Juneau where there were maximum weight restrictions and one man was actually turned away on the day. There can also be height restrictions for thrill rides like zip lining, perhaps age restrictions for you know, alcohol drinking related tours. Next, look in the fine print for details of the distance from the port and how long you're going to spend on the bus. So for example, also on that region Japan cruise, the tour to Kyoto from Kobe, where we docked, had one and a half hours on the bus there and one and a half hours back. Now people seemed shocked when we set off to learn this because they had not read the fine print. Thirdly, and one I slipped up on my last Caribbean cruise, is to check the detail of exactly what is going to happen on the excursion and the time allocated for each activity. So on that trip, I booked a beach break in St. Lucia. Now, if I'd read the detail properly, I would have realized that we were gonna spend almost half of that time 
doing a shop excursion at a center with chocolate making, candle making, t-shirts, screen printing, and other shopping stuff, instead of all the time at the beach. Fourthly, check what is and is not included. So for example, on that region Japan cruise I've been talking about, in many places, the excursion covered our entry into the grounds, but not to go inside the attractions or buildings within them. So in that Kyoto excursion I mentioned earlier, it got me into the Nijo castle grounds, but touring the actual castle itself, I personally had to then pay for in addition to the excursion entry fees. Now, if the tour is over lunchtime, also check if a meal is or is not included. So again, on that Kyoto tour, it was included in a local resort, but on others I went, on over meal times, it was not included. So important that you check what is and isn't included. Also check in the fine print for any dress code. So for example, when I was in Cairo at the start of my Nile River cruise this year, we had to have our shoulders and knees covered on the day that we were visiting a mosque. Active excursions, like say going on an ATV tour, may require you, know, to, you to have closed shoes. So always check fine print for dress code. Now there is another thing that I see cruisers repeatedly getting wrong and it affects their bank balance badly. Your most expensive excursion options will usually be booking the cruise line ones because they mark them up to make a profit on the tours their local providers run in the cruise line's name. So they're all gonna make a, a markup, a profit. So this is why I do these quick checks before finally booking a cruise line excursion. So first of all, I check if I can book the activity direct, and if so, for less, which is pretty much always is. Now, for example, I absolutely love doing the Y Pass and Yukon train in Skagway, Alaska. I love it. And I always book that direct for way less money than if I was doing it as a cruise line excursion. I go in, by the way, months and months before because it does sell out. So getting in early is key if you're booking direct with the the attraction or the provider. Another is I never book hop on hop off buses through the cruise line. For example, this summer, I was on a Norwegian Viva cruise that stopped in Barcelona. Now the cruise line was selling the hop on hop off bus for over 70 euros, it's about 75 US dollars, but I could buy a hop on hop off day pass for just 35 euros at the booth in the terminal. The other thing I always do is compare with independent alternatives like VentureAshore.com, Shore excursionsgroup.com. And now the second, by the way, makes a lot of their guarantee that they promise to get me back to the ship on time. And if they don't, they will cover the cost of getting me to rejoin the ship at the next port. But whatever route you go, this next mistake, I unfortunately have seen too many times mess up people's trips. Most cruisers seem to wait until just before the cruise or once they're on board to book excursions, hence the long lines at the shore excursions desk on embarkation day. This is a terrible idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, most cruise lines have a pretty good cancellation policy, usually the ability to cancel 48 hours before an excursion with no penalty. So I always go in early and I book excursions as soon as they are available in my cruise planner online to make sure I get the ones I want from the cruise line, knowing I can tweak once I'm on the trip or even cancel them. I've been on so many cruises where people have gone on what is a trip of a lifetime and missed out on the key excursions they wanted to do. One that really, really sticks in my mind was on a South American trip on Holland America last year, where the highlight was going to see penguins in the Falklands, which for most people was gonna be the only cruise they'll ever go on in their lifetime to see penguins in their natural environment. But I met way too many people that had waited until they got on board to try and book that excursion, but it was sold out. I had booked months and months ahead and I got to go on the excursion and I got to see the penguins. So I put in my diary, the day excursions are gonna be open and then I go in and I lock them in for all my cruises. However, once cruisers have the excursions booked, there are a couple of mistakes I keep seeing people do once they actually Go on them. On every trip, I always see people traveling with friends or family, really annoyed that they're put on different buses or groups. Now it's so easy because all you literally need to do is check in at the same time with all the group together to be on the same bus. The next one drives me crazy, which is passengers not paying attention to nor respecting meetup times, especially if there's free time to go off and do stuff on a tour. The tours end up going at the pace of the slowest person. Now, for example, 
On an excursion in Pisa, Italy this summer, on each site we were given free time, but every time a family always came back late, reducing the time we had to explore other attractions. The guide kept saying they needed to watch it because he would have to leave them behind if they were late at the last stop because he had to get us back to the ship at a set time because it was quite some distance away. On the last stop, 25 minutes after the meet time, they were not back and so we left without them. Now they did eventually get back to the ship before the ship departed by having to catch a taxi at their own great expense. Now there is another huge mistake I see around deciding whether to self-explore, use independent tours or stick with the cruise line. And there are four times that I will always go with the cruise line over any option. Now I talk about that and what they are in this video, starting with the one thing that most people completely overlook. See you over there.